Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. People go to the coast, people go to the rivers, go to, to lakes. They're drawn to water. And there's something um, a little mysterious about a river, about the life that's in it. It's a very long-term strategy. It'll be my lifetime of working on it, and it'll be my son's lifetime of working on it. Our winters have been getting warmer since about 1991. Almost six to seven degrees warmer in the winter. That's pretty significant. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks, Guts, Glory, Ram.
This is footage shot back in 1915 at the J.A. Ranch. The ranch was founded by Charles Goodnight and John Adair and is still operated by descendants of the Adair family. At its peak size in 1883, the J.A. encompassed over a million acres. Since 2005, Andrew Bivens has run the land management side of the ranch. The salt cedar beetles, they defoliate the leaves off these trees, which will eventually kill the tree. That's what we're doing, you know, what we're doing today, my kids are gonna reap the benefit of, not me. Andrew is the latest in a long family lineage that goes back five generations. The child in his arms represents generation six. It's a very long-term strategy It'll be my lifetime of working on it, and it'll be my son's lifetime I'm working on it. And hopefully our grandchildren will have a ranch that's more of a prairie than what my son and I will have. There was a time when the prairie was open as far as the eye could see. But when early settlers removed fire from the natural landscape, invasive vegetation like mesquite and juniper overtook much of the land. The brushwork side of it, just clearing this land and then implementing prescribed fire, I feel is the only way we're going to get it back. And we'll never get it back to what it was. Try to slowly improve it to get it closer to what it originally was. Another land management tool that Andrew uses is called grubbing. We're just after target species of mesquite and juniper. The process can be time consuming, expensive, and extremely difficult. That's not the hard part. The operator is the hard part. I have a fabulous operator. And this is the fabulous result on a prairie that's been treated by both grubbing and prescribed burn. Everything out here is in competition for the little water we get. And pulling the woody invasive species out allows more water for the grass. In and competition on the range is fierce. Each juniper can soak up to 12 to 15 gallons of water a day. That's water that could go to replenishing the natural prairie grass. The brush work that Andrew's been doing on this property is phenomenal. You follow up treatments on it, no burn. Todd Montandon is a Texas Parks and Wildlife biologist who gives Andrew technical support. Andrew's really been able to make some pretty dramatic improvements on the ranch. To reclaim country, a lot of times this takes a lot of time. So what I've done is I've created a digital map of the JA. To manage everything here on the ranch, Andrew has a unique approach. Pasture boundaries, roads, water facilities. He uses data. All our windmills, wells, dirt tanks. Nearly everything. Any kind of brushwork we put on our map. And it all goes into this database. And so now we have a pretty detailed database of all the brushwork that's been done on the ranch. What I hope to do with this is allow it so when my children and my grandchildren are running the ranch, that they say, oh, look, here's what my grandfather did in 2010. Here's what he did in 2011. Andrew might have to wait a few decades before his kids are old enough to appreciate what dad's doing on the computer. But waiting doesn't bother him. It's what you have to do. Leave the land in better shape for the next generation than how I found the land. What will Texas look like 100 years in the future? What are we doing now that will have the greatest significance then? Where will our most basic resources come from? Food, water, energy? One thing we know is that the climate will be different. We also know the sea level will be higher. We know it because it is happening right now, right here in Texas. You just have to look very closely 
and be very, very patient. Based on tide gauges that we've had out there since the uh, early 1900s in some cases, we're seeing about one to two feet in 100 years. That translates into about two and a half millimeters per year up to six and a half millimeters per year. So it's a substantial rate, a, a bit higher than the global rate. Depending on where you are in Texas, the sea level is rising at different rates. There's higher rates on the upper Texas coast. Rates decrease down into the Corpus Christi area and decrease even further down in the Padre Island National Seashore and increase a little bit down near the Rio Grande Delta area. In March of 2010, the Hart Research Institute for Gulf of Mexico Studies and Texas A&M University in Corpus Christi hosted an international conference on sea level rise in the Gulf of Mexico. This is a one-way street. Sea level doesn't just suddenly go down again. It will continue that upward trend and continue rising for the foreseeable future. The question is, just how much is sea level going to rise? Antarctica and Greenland hold a central position in the sea level rise debate because the ice sheets hold a great deal of ice that could melt and become part of the oceans and would raise the ocean. And this is the biggest uncertainty that we have about sea level rise. There are other contributions to future sea level rise, which are the thermal expansion of the oceans and the contribution from mountain glaciers around the world. But those things are relatively predictable compared to the uncertainty that we have over Antarctica and Greenland, the big ice sheets. Antarctica and Greenland are a long way from Texas. What's going on here, right now? Summers are just as hot as they've always been. What we are seeing is uh, changes in winter temperatures. Our winters have been getting warmer since about 1991. Almost six to seven degrees warmer in the winter. That's pretty significant. These temperature readings come from the routine sampling that Texas Parks and Wildlife has done since 1974. With our net samples, they gather the number of species caught. We get a fin clip also on that one. The size of the species. It's over a meter long. And they collect environmental measurements along with the sample. Temperature is 27.8. That's uh, one of the most comprehensive monitoring programs in the world. With climate change, there are winners Gorgeous. and losers. Founder have declined. They're winter spawners. They seem to require cold winters to produce more juveniles. The warmer the winter, the fewer flounder juveniles we see. There it goes. Other species are increasing. We're seeing more tropical species, in particular gray snapper. They'll die below about 50 degrees water temperature. And since about 91, we've had almost no winters get that cold, and their population has increased exponentially. We are also seeing changes with the migration of plant species. Black mangrove. Rockport used to be the northern limit, but since these warmer winters, they have moved northward along the coast. They're as far up as Palacios now. There's a red mangrove, which is characteristic of the Caribbean, and we're starting to see some areas become populated with red mangroves. What will climate change and sea level rise mean for Texas in the future? Scientists predict that in 100 years, the sea level could rise three feet. That would significantly alter our coastline. The current sea level rise is not a situation that humans have faced in modern times. That is, since we started to create built environments, cities and 
uh, bulkheads and things along the coast, sea level has never been rising in that period. Sea level is going to rise between a meter and two in the next hundred years. We actually can't change that at this point. So what we're going to have to do is adapt to it. And there are two ways to do it. One is to try to defend the way the Netherlands has historically over the last thousand years. Or you can move and retreat from it. And I have to say that we're not going to defend most places on the coast because it's simply going to be too hard and too expensive. So we will defend some places, but we will in fact retreat from most places at the coast over the next century. Historically, sea level has gone up and down over geologic time. Before people built cities and bridges and things, the natural environment just moved, but now we're in the way. If we're going to have natural environments like fringe swamps and marshes and lowland forests, where are they going to move to? We're going to have to plan that. And the question is, what are we going to do with the stuff we leave behind? I understand it's difficult for people to put a lot of faith or trust in things that they can't put their finger on. The temperature is 27.1. And so that's why I often fall back to the actual measurements. Don't emphasize the, the computer modeling or the projections or the theory. Just look at the facts that we have actually observed to have occurred over the last 100 years. And it's obvious that we need to do things differently during the next 100 years, and that takes planning. Have you ever wondered why some animals are brightly colored and others seem to blend right in with their surroundings? An animal's coloration is a very special adaptation for survival. Birds use bright colors to identify each other. The male painted bunting can easily spot a competitor and defend his territory. His bright colors also distract would-be predators so the dull colored female and young go unnoticed. The venomous coral snake also has bright colors. It's so successful that the harmless milk snake mimics these colors to fool predators. If you look closely, you'll see that the red and yellow bands only touch on the coral snake. Survival of both hunters and the hunted depend on good coloration. A gray brown coyote can secretly stalk its prey in a mix of underbrush and low light. The swamp rabbit's fur blends into the cover of brush, vines, and coastal marshes. The color and texture of the horned lizard camouflage it from predators and help it ambush unsuspecting prey. Coloration can also fool the eye. In dappled forest light, the fawn's spots blur its outline, making it less recognizable to predators. Wildlife coloration is a fascinating adaptation of warning, attraction, or deception. The next time an animal shows you its colors, decide, is it saying, see me or see you? If you have an interest in hunting in Texas, there are numerous public hunting opportunities across the state regardless of your age. There are ample opportunities for the youth of Texas, who are the future of hunting, to spend quality time outdoors with a parent or guardian. For example, these programs include our youth hunting season, which only allows the youth to take game, and the Texas Youth Hunting Program. The Texas Youth Hunting Program is a cooperative effort with the Texas Wildlife Association and the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department that allows youth aged 9 through 17 the opportunity to hunt both public and private land across the state. Texas also has lots of state land. There are numerous wildlife management areas, state parks, and other recreational areas that offer both day use and annual public hunt opportunities. 
Because dove hunting has become so popular in Texas, for the past few years, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department has been aggressively pursuing the leasing of private lands for public hunting across the state. There's also federal property in Texas that provides public hunting opportunities. For example, Army Corps of Engineer property, national forests, and national recreation areas. No matter where in the state you are, there's a public hunting opportunity near you. So take full advantage of what Texas has to offer. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.